Montreal. Uh, we have our third of the JMST instrument talk today. Today we're going to hear the overview of the NIRIS instrument. Take it away. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so it's a pleasure to uh, talk to you about the NIRIS instrument. So on the on slide two, well, that's me controlling, right? Uh, oh. Okay. So. So I'm going to talk to you about, uh, uh, give you a little historical background about where NIRIS is coming from, uh, brief uh, instrument overview, what is NIRIS, what it does, the absorbing modes, and I'll start by giving you a, a brief overview of the, the NIRIS GTO program, exactly what we are up to and what we expect to do with our, with our time, the uh, guaranteed time observation. So background, so I'm going to bring you back to the dawn of time early 2000 when this project was called the Next Generation Space Telescope. It was a time 8 meter telescope, uh, going at L2. And at that time, the instrument package was actually three instruments. Uh, the camera, near cam, uh, the infrared multi-object spectrograph, near spec, and MIRI. Made an infrared and a gather, which uh, was not meant to do any, any science. And so when the partnership is actually shipping up, shipping up between NASA uh, the ESA and CSA. So the time the year I joined this project, uh, I was invited to join the NIRCAM proposal by Marsha Riki, uh, her proposal to NASA, uh, to build NIRCAM. And NIRCAM at that time had uh, two tunable filters on board NIRCAM. So, and uh, this is uh, basically uh, our contribution to the... Really, Canada was trying to get a sign on board James Webb. And the way this thing shaped, shaped up at that time was to provide the tunable filters. Uh, soon in the project, as you all know, ESA was providing near spec, jointly with the detector, and me as a joint US Europe instrument. And these things have not changed really. To the Jura replan, uh, NEOCAM becomes a US only instrument uh, for all very good reasons, ITAR, among other things. Uh, and uh, the tunable filters are not uh, considered to be level one requirements, and they were they turn, turn out. And um, this is at that time, uh, we're not discussing my colleague, uh, John Hutching, who was in charge of the fine guidance sensor. And well, why don't we try to bring the, the tunable filters uh, to the back of FGS? So this is the, uh, the tunable filter was born, was born in this uh, replant. Re 2005, uh, there's a major mass crisis within JWST, and we need to, to remove some. And actually, TFI is actually threatened. We eliminated, and it was salvaged into a single channel tunable filter. Hey, Renee. Could you make up a little bit? Is that uh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, you, you have trouble to, to hear me? Okay, so I was saying that the the T5 was salvaged into a single channel in, uh, instrument. Um, this was not without challenges. In 2008, uh, uh, we, this, we started discussions to, to about a lack of instrument because there was the the, the ethylon that was the, the heart of tunable filter uh, was a critical component that was not uh, uh, working very well to a point where in in July 2011. Uh, we decided that in uh, the end, it was a CSA's decision to go forward under my recommendation and the science team to reconvert TFI into a new instrument, NIRIS. And uh, FGS and NIRIS was delivered to NASA. To... So on, on slide four, I'm giving you a, a one-slide summary of what FGS and NIRIS are. So this is basically one instrument in one box, provided by CSA. The fine sensor, which uh, prime function is to do gathering of the observer, uh, be an infrared camera, 0.65 micron without any filters, or so this is pancreatic, with a view about 2.3 arc minutes, uh, and uh, the kind of uh, noise signal angle uh, uh, performance of 4 meter arc seconds. Uh, so we are required to cover 95% of the sky, uh, to have a high star over 95% of the sky with the uh, magnitude JB of. 18.9. So this stands for infrared imager and slitless spectrograph. Uh, it's an instrument very similar to NIRCAM. It's a 0.65 micron infrared camera 
uh, very similar to the NIACAM long wavelength channel. And as for observing modes, and the main science drivers, which was very much inherited from DFI, uh, which were doing two things mainly, mainly high reach of galaxies, the early universe, and exoplanet spectroscopy, uh, transclips. And we have a mode to do uh, high constant imaging. That gives you uh, some basic information about, about NIRIS. Uh, I'm, I'm giving you a link here, which is a, uh, a NIRIS pod guide, which I encourage you to go. There's uh, all kinds of useful, useful information. Most of them are in this presentation, but uh, it's a nice little package you can uh, download. So uh, the instrument capability is very similar to NIRCAM. It's an OE2RG detector uh, with a cutoff at 5.2 microns. Uh, view exactly the same as near cam long wavelength 2.2 arc minutes with the same plate scale near cam long wavelength and uh, we have a, a, a pupil wheel and filter wheel and the pupil wheel, uh, has uh, some uh, dispersing elements uh, grisms uh, and um, aperture mask and the filter wheel has also two grisms to do uh, slitless spectroscopy so basically uh, uh, yeah never can do imaging but also uh, slitless spectroscopy Okay, just a brief view of what the instrument looks like. It's an all reflective design, so very high throughput. So, light gets from the OTE from plane. There's a pick off mirror. Every science instrument has their own pick off to pick off the beam. And then it goes to a columnar, which has a three mirror assembly. And then dual wheel optics. And then finally, another TMA all the way to the detector. So, it's all gold mirrors, very high throughput uh, instrument. Okay, the dual said uh, are distributed over two wheels, the filter wheels and the, and, and the pupil. I'll show you a picture later on. And uh, so it's actually configured so that uh, we have uh, all main uh, broad filters from near cam. In fact, historically, uh, the plan the, to reconfigure TFI into near cam, we had to do that on a very short notice of about a year. And to do so, uh, we had to rely on near cam assets, basically. The filters, the broadband filters inside NIRCAM are actually the near spare filters that placed later on, but to uh, to document uh, on time to NASA, uh, July 2012, we had to uh, uh, borrow uh, NIRCAM's assets. So we are already uh, in depth to NIRCAM for this. This is where uh, all the components that uh, we put with seven years. Uh, observing modes. Um, so the, is a summary of all four observing modes, and three are effectively used, uh, and one is, is uh, in, in support. So we're doing wide field slitless spectroscopy, so with us. Its main action is for high of galaxies, but we also other things. Uh, uh, part of our program is to look at uh, uh, Pythene objects in young clusters using uh, slitless spectroscopy. So the wavelength range here is 0.2 to 2.2 micron. Uh, we have two grisms. I'll show you the details later on. On at the result, well, 150. Uh, we didn't have uh, sensitivity for uh, uh, or with um, the, uh, the 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 1.4 micron filter. We call single object slitless spectroscopy. Uh, this was specifically designed. To do uh, exoplanet transit, uh, transit. Uh, it's optimized for bright stars and relatively broad with light range 0.6 to 0.8 micron and a ring power of about a thousand with a brightness limit of uh, it, it depends on the mode, but uh, it's typically seven, but it can go up to six depending on the sub array that we use. Very unique feature as well from NIRIS is called aperture masking interferometry. Uh, in French means in French means friend. It's application for high contrast imaging. Uh, we're carrying it's used with three filters and potentially a, a, a fourth one. These are mid band filters, which us to do contrasts of uh, uh, maybe up to ten minus four, but at very short inner working angles from T to uh, fifty milli uh, milliarc seconds, which is very complementary to the other graphs on board James Webb in your cam. And uh, uh, well, as I mentioned, there is 
as it's hard, it's a broadband imaging, so it's an infrared camera. So we carry the even near cam filters from uh, 0 0.90 all the way to 4.4 micron. And uh, the short wavelength filters, F0T, 115, 150, and 200, are used blocking filters for doing a slit left spectroscopy. In so, uh, broadband imaging is actually used uh, when you do uh, slit left spectroscopy, you need to know where your your your, your source are, uh, you know, the uh, caliber and whatnot. And so we're using imaging for that purpose. But normally, uh, you all know, we have a workhorse instrument to do broadband imaging on board web, and it's called near cam. So we don't anticipate nearest to be used as a prime instrument to do imaging. However, this would be a very nice extra field view for parallel observing with, uh, with near and when we configure the instrument, uh, we make sure to to have a clear path. So if you go back to the uh, the uh, the dual element components, you'll see can uh, configuration whereby it's open. So that can be used as a, uh, a gather basically. So it's uh, uh, the the gather I, I forgot to mention has two field of view, two detectors, and provides redundancy. And in fact, nearest can be perceived as that too. Uh, of course, we have to do guiding, but uh, you know, uh, on a on a on a mission of this scale at L2, it's going to have lots of uh, redundancy. So in short, NERIS provides unique science models, plus backup uh, imaging and 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 multi-object spectroscopy to to the respect. Okay, so to uh, wide field left spectroscopy. So what you see uh, in red uh, uh, on, on the left, you're just choosing one of the blocking filters you want to use and bind it with uh, uh, one of the two prisms. Uh, we call them GR50, uh, them at a resolving power of 150. And, uh, so and the next slide shows you why we have we have two prisms. This mode allows you to do uh, 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 you know to to see every to get a spectrum of every source. In the, in the field of view, uh, uh, and typically you'll you'll have your oscillator of typically 3,000 galaxies in one field of view. Obviously, at the same sensitivity as near spec, that's why we have a micro shutter on board web to limit the background. But still, you are at L2. The background is still really small, uh, and so we we can do that with a very good sensitivity. In fact, why we have two grisms uh, is to among other things. To make sure that uh, if we have a, a strong line, uh, you know where it is. There's a generosity between the wave of that emission lines and its, its spatial position. If two prism orthogonal positions, then uh, you lift this ambiguity. You know where the source is by just crossing, as the diagram shows. You know where the source is in, in the sky and where you can uh, probably carry. Uh, the, the wavelength of that source. Uh, aspect about the uh, the other orient, and that, that's uh, going to be useful on the whole, is that this provides some uh, uh, and mitigates contamination. So obviously, there's no slit, so all the sources are putting a spectrum. So uh, having an orthogonal directions helps to to mitigate uh, contamination. So uh, basically, what is capable of, uh, as I said, uh, in a blank. Field, there are about 3,000 galaxies at magnitude uh, less uh, brighter than 28. So that's a lot of sources. Just for reference, near spec can get about 100 sources at, at, at that time. Uh, so the multiplex advantage here is, is huge, uh, but again, with less sensitivity. There's no free lunch, of course. Uh, we get almost complete spectral coverage from 0.92 to 0.2 micron with the, uh, the short wavelength filters. Uh, at least one strong line from Z equals 0.5 to 5.9, and uh, Lyman alpha is actually present from redshift 6, uh, 6 to 17 in the nearest uh, uh, spectral. Uh, uh, the, the resolving power is typically 150, varies from, from 100 and 200, and it was shown to be complementary to the high resolving power mode of near spec, which is you know 1,000, and the low resolving mode, the prism mode. Uh, from near spec, which is uh, which have very broad wavelength coverage in near spec, 0.6 to micron, but uh, in the uh, in the short wavelength, the, the resolving power is very 
small, typically 30, 50, uh, and uh, 150 has uh, advantages for uh, rate determination and, and, and uh, another thing. So our resolution is about uh, 0.06 arc second, which corresponds typically at 0.5 kiloparsecs. And as mentioned, our two prisms uh, are cross dispersed to mitigate contamination. And so operationally speaking, this is very simple. Uh, you just point and shoot. Uh, there's no pre imaging you have to do. Well, there are some pre imaging you have to do, but relatively shallow observations. There's just to know uh, where the sources are in general. The picture you see here is actually uh, real data. Uh, real data taken from the, from the third cryovac test campaign, CB3 at Goddard. And so this is the two uh, GRISM superimposed on one another against the road order and the very sharp uh, uh, GRISMs. Uh, I, I forgot which, uh, which filter it is. I think this is 115 here. Uh, you get the negative order. This one without, uh, sorry, this, this actually, this, this is nothing without filters. So you can see all the orders. Uh, and there are uh, there are a very small fraction of the, of the degree at 90 degrees one another. Yeah, questions. Okay, this slide is just to show you that uh, there's a lot of. Oops, sorry, I'm gonna stop this. There's a lot of he uh, with HST to do uh, slit spectroscopy with FC3. Uh, uh, so you can see actual image here, uh, and uh, there's. Uh, uh, tools to do uh, uh, to models uh, in the field of view and then subtract them to uh, identify some sources. And, uh, so this uh, uh, Gabriel Brower, which uh, recently joined the NERSC team, is one of them to to do this kind of stuff uh, with, with Hubble. So they will give you actual uh, sensitivity. Uh, the next two slides, uh, this, the, the one I'm showing you right now is the, the line flux sensitivity. Uh, and uh, over the, all the, the filters, you can see that, uh, of course, the sensitivity is slightly better when you use a an after 140. Uh, sorry. And so that gives you, uh, of course, the sensitivity is better for, on a narrow filter because you get less background. Uh, but at the end, uh, it's, well, it depends on your application. Uh, but uh, in practice, we're using 150 because we have uh, a continuous wavelength coverage. So the uh, the next slide is the actual continuum sensitivity. So just to give you what this can do, uh, uh, the slide I'm showing here is, is an actual simulation, but based on real Hubble observation. This is a uh, with simulation done by Chris Willett, uh my colleague who is the leader of, of this part of our program. This is a feature field uh, uh, MAC cluster, uh, the uh, uh, 200 filters. On the left, this is the broadband image. And on the right, this is the slated uh, grism image. You can see all the spectra. Of course, it'd be messy in the end. Uh, but uh, well, at the same, at the same time, people have, have also developed tools, as I mentioned, to to deal with that. Okay, just uh, a zoom of uh, only one percent of the field of view, just to show the richness of this kind of, uh, of, of observation. There's uh, all the uh, the, uh, it looks like point source are basically emission line objects, and uh, so this case where uh, you know you really need two orients to to make sure the to to properly identify the wavelength of that of that source. Capability complement to your account and and your spec. So, uh, uh, a recent detection by Osh et al. Uh, done with the G141 GRISM on board with C3, a Hubble. Uh, this is what is the highest redshiftly, uh, spectroscopy confirmed redshift galaxies, a redshift of 11.09. It's quite amazing when you think that uh, Hubble can actually get this kind of uh, redshift. So, uh, of course, the detection is, is, is marginal, but significant. It's there. You can see the alignment break uh, at the, the break at around 1.4 1. micro. Next slide, this slide I'm showing here is an actual simulation of, of the objects. And it'll take about 20 hours to get to this object with a very detection. Well, what, what you see here, uh, that assumes about three hours per grism. Uh, you repeat over the, the, the three filters. So you can see uh, you don't see anything, as you would expect, in the short wavelength filter, 115. 
2018, and then pops up in the 150 and, and the 200. Uh, that's really somewhat optimistic in the sense that uh, uh, the crowd issue is not uh, taken into account here, uh, but still, it gives you an idea of the kind of uh, uh, data we're going to have, and th this kind of integration time is is typical of uh, one of our fields for, for our GTO program, which I'll, I'll come back to. Okay, that concludes the, the my overview of the uh, the WIFAS mode. Now let me move on to the single object slitless spectroscopy. For short, we call it SOS. So what we have is uh, on the pupil wheel, we have an element called the GR700. Uh, it's a cross dispersed grism. And, uh, and you combine it with a clear uh, position on the filter wheel. So there's no blocking filter on that mode. I'll give you a summary of what this GRISM does. It's basically uh, optimized for transit spectroscopy. Um, we have a built-in default weak lens uh, uh, that uh, basically defaults the, uh, the, the, the spectrum along the spatial direction but uh, preserving the spectral resolution along the dispersion axis. Uh, so we do that for two reasons, to increase dynamic range, to minimize red noise, and also uh, minimize undersampling issue in flat field error. It's a sort of implementation of the successful scanning mode that people have been using on, the, on, on HST, but I insist this is not scanning mode. On HST, you basically scan mirror to, 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 to scan the source along the spatial directions while you're observing and you do that quite fast. Uh, we have some capability to, uh, to do uh, scanning, but at a much uh, smaller rate. So uh, let's be clear that we cannot do space scanning with any of the science instruments on board WSD. And there is the only thing that can do something close. So no, it, is, it, it, it is broad, uh, simultaneous with coverage. We cover 0 0.6 to 20 micron in one shot over through dispersed orders, orders one, one and two. And as I mentioned, there's no blocking filters. And we do it at a resolving power, typically of 1,000 uh, in, in the first order. It's very 100 to 1,600. So this is a lot of magnitude higher than what is available uh, uh, with the uh, uh, Hubble. So this is the, the dual wheel before it was integrated into the instrument. And so the, the square orange things is actually the, uh, the grism. And the, we, we see a view here from the, uh, the, uh, the filter wheel side. Uh, so you, you see the grism combined with the aperture and all the filters. And the, the clear, you see the, 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 the clear components uh, and, and at 10 o'clock and, and noon are the GR150 grisms. So details about the uh, the hardware implementation. So uh, this is a, a zinc selenide grism, direct, directly ruled. Uh, that was a very dependent to, to to get actually. There were only a few people in the world that can do this. Uh, this one is very very good. And the front prism is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, to do cross dispersion. And uh, uh, all shown in the uh, schematically because the ratio of curvature is uh, uh, exaggerated here. It's much weaker than that. It's about 50 meters of uh, radius of curvature, and that gives you this kind of PSF that you see at the bottom. What you see there is a, is a lab measurement of the, the, the nearest PSF. So you can see it's uh, defocused in one direction, and uh, while uh, and this is basically diffraction emitted in the wavelength direction, and this is what we want. On the right, you see the actual spectral layout. This is a simulation, and uh, you see the first order, which covers about from 0.7 to two and a half run, but in fact you can shift this thing the way you like. And uh, if you you shift the the subarray judiciously, uh, you can cover from 0.6 to 2.5 micron. Um, the second order uh, covers from 0.6 to about 1.2 micron. And the full array. So in fact, uh, normally we use the the sauce in the in the array mode. There's various modes which I'll just talk about. Okay, so use the actual real data. Uh, this is data taken from the, the last uh, cryovac uh, cryo test campaign, so it shows that uh, it works very well. Uh, we do have the the PSF that we design and design, uh, and so uh, the uh, you can see on the right the actual trace. This is a deep uh, deep stack uh, that was done to 
actually the, the stability of, of the instrument. Uh, I won't have time to talk about that, but uh, it's actually we have a very data set to to, to demonstrate that uh, uh, this works very well. There's no rank act that we see on Hubble. Uh, it, it's very well behaved. In fact, the, the issue is the, the lamp stability. We can measure that with the squid uh, accuracy. So it's actually saturated. Well, not saturated, but uh, it's a log scale. So we see the uh, the, the, the second order. And also the order. The discontinuity that you see, uh, if I can point uh, around here, uh, this is due to the uh, the optical simulator of the instrument. It's not in the in the we should not see that uh, on orbit. It's, it's well understood. This is part of the scattered light of the uh, OC optical simulator. So uh, just to show, to show you how how the uh, the Orders are compared to the overall field of view, so you can see the overall layout of the nearest field of view. So in practice, what you do, you position your target at that spot right here, and then target acquisition, you make sure you're, you're exactly where you'd like to be, and then you insert the grism, and then you get the, that uh, uh, the order there. And you can look orders outside the field of view. And so the, uh, of the first uh, test campaign we did, uh, back most two years ago. Um, so uh, the soft mode actually has two modes. The, the standard mode covers the whole wavelength range, 0.60 to 0.8 micron, with orders. And the saturation limit here depends how you read the detector. Uh, uh, if you do a, a mode whereby you do only a reset plus only one read, we don't do a CDS. We can afford that on bright sources because we hope we, uh, we're going to be photonoid limited. Uh, then you, your saturation limit is about 7.2, assuming the well depth of 75,000 electrons. And this is not an assumption. This is now measured at the degree that uh, we can achieve this kind of uh, well depth. The bright mode is basically a sub array that you put on top of the first order on uh, 96 pixel by 2448. So you have the first order. And doing that, you're, you're restricting your, your wavelength covers from 105 to 2.8 micron. And the limit is slightly uh, higher because you're uh, reading faster over a smaller subarray. So you can go up to uh, uh, magnitude, magnitude 6, 6 magnitude. OK, this is just more details about the actual uh, uh, saturation one can achieve uh, doing the, the standard Ideally, you'd like to do the, the readout mode on the left, which is a reset plus trees, a standard core double sam sampling. Uh, and, uh, but we believe that the one on the right should be should be okay. Uh, but it, we, we have some tests to do. In fact, we have some data taken from CV taken with that mode to check that uh, uh, the data before the noise limit. See, the, the section limit is not uh, a black and white thing. Uh, you can see that you can saturate the, uh, uh, the 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 first order, but you won't saturate the second order because the throughput is slightly lower. Uh, as this is expected, uh, and so uh, you know it, it's it's not you'll have. In fact, almost we do have tools to plan your observation as to what optimal uh, subarray configuration you should use for a given target. So I'm kind of illustrating the saturation, and just to show that it goes very fast. So this is where we are in subarray, um, the bright subarray mode. So we're taking only one, uh, the, the, the first order, and so we're covering only one to 2.8 micron. And so you can see that uh, the, the PSF has two arms, right? So it's not a, a nicely Gaussian PSF. So you can see that the, the PSF start to be saturated. But this, the rest of the spectrum should be OK. And so uh, even if you have some data that, that separates, uh, a fraction of your of wavelength uh, coverage will be, will, will be preserved. So between 5 and 6, this is where uh, you start worry about uh, saturation. OK, what you see here is basically the, the, the notes, uh, given the, the very good knowledge that we have of the throughput of the whole instrument uh, and level, uh, all that Characterized in the lab, and so a good understanding of the throughput, well within 
Uh, this is a typical performance that one achieves. Uh, this is the saturation limit, the standard magnitude star. One will achieve about uh, uh, 50 ppn in, 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 in with, with force. That's clock time. Um, I want to discuss this that you know not have, have one hand observing efficiency here uh, because when you do read, read uh, that mode is only efficient in terms of collecting photons to about well to exactly 23 um, percent and does the the mode which is reset read is efficient at uh, 50 percent okay just to put that into a context in terms of targets that we want to look at so what you seeing here is a uh, a figure uh, provided by uh, George Ricker, PI of the test mission, uh, as for the, the typical uh, expected yield for Earths and super Earths at high e ecliptic uh, latitude. That, uh, that these are the three regions to do uh, more visits, and, and you can see the, the, the nearest saturation limits uh, are can catch the, the, the test targets that uh, we'll, we'll have. But it's just to show the, the wide variety of, uh, of, of planet we, we can do. Uh, uh, bottom is a simple relationship to establish the, 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 the depth of the uh, spectroscopic feature you're, you're looking at. It depends, of course, on, on the temperature of the planet, the, the molecular weight, the composition of the atmosphere, and the density. Uh, so taking example there, you can see that there's a wide variety of signal from uh, several thousands of ppms to uh, a few times of PPM. Uh, it may be that misleading here. JG 1214 is now well established to be very clear. So we, we know that we don't have signal at that level. But it's just to illustrate that uh, should have a JG 1214 like object with this kind of uh, uh, temperature with an enriched atmosphere, uh, you'll, you'll get uh, plenty of signal that should be relatively straightforward to uh, uh, do with, with, with web. So in green, the kind of objects that will do under only one visit. One will be sufficient to to, to get uh, uh, the signal noise that you want. In yellow, something that will require more than one visit. And in, in, in red, well, those will be the the, the hearts, uh, the uh, the uh, you know high density uh, right, uh, planets in the habitable zone. Those have signal of about a few, you know, maybe 30 to 50 ppm's. That obviously is much harder. Here on the very late uh, on the very late type star, uh, uh, it goes as as the square of the radius of the uh, of the star. So the the smaller the the, the star here, the game is, of course. The next slide is just to uh, remind you that uh, there's many many ways to do spectroscopy with JWST. Uh, this is a nice plot uh, provided by my colleague Pierre Fury, the PI of NearSpec, which gives you. Uh, Everything can do basically, uh, so it gives you the spectral resolution as a function of wavelength. Uh, so you can see nearest there, which has which show the two orders in red uh, together provide the, the broadest wavelength range. The only thing that provides something better in, in terms of wavelength coverage is near spec uh, prism. This is the green trash shown at the bottom. Uh, the, the prism gives you uh, wavelength co coverage from 0.6 to 5 micron, 5.5 micron. But at a very, really low resolving power, varies from 30 to uh, a few hundred. And the, 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 the problem that uh, because it's not defocused as near as your limit now is more like uh, 11 than 12. OK, so the slides are simulations. One simulations uh, uh, based on the, our knowledge of the, uh, the performance of the instrument. So of course, this is very naive. This is very is simple minded here. And um and so this this is showing the native resolving power. So this is a uh, uh, the case of uh, uh this hot uh A G A one one eight nine seven three three. Uh I say like because you know likely we won't be able to do this one in particular uh because of condemnation issue. I'll come back to that later. But the bottom line here is that uh only one bit and you'll get this kind of signal to know Gray envelope is the actual uh, noise, so you see the richness of uh, of uh, optimal that one can achieve here, and that that target is is a bit limit, is right at uh, the saturation limit of uh, of nearest, and it's only about two hours to do this, three hours. 
show you uh, the actual uh, uh, HSD wavelength coverage, just to see the the wealth of, uh, uh, of, additional, but, uh, of additional information that uh, NIRIS will, will give you. Uh, so you won't have to to, uh, to come back to it to get the, the rest of the wavelength coverage. The drawback of the other is in Smith mode on, on with, with near back. For example, respect can give the resuming power of uh, three tons, uh, but uh, you won't have the whole with range. So of course, so this is the, the kind of uh, kinds you'll have to to decide. It's, it won't be trivial which mode to, to, to choose, but then we'll all know on orbit when we have the actual performance of all of all the instrument modes. Something more uh, more sporty. Uh, this is a JJ twelve forty light object. Uh, Basically, a dead dwarf, uh, and um, basically with three visits, one achieves a noise level of about 25 ppm. So the big question is, of course, with Webb, is what will be the noise floor? We don't know that uh, that answer, of course, and uh, uh, we'll only know when we get on orbit. But all I can say is that, uh, of course, on uh, C3 and Hubble, where everything gets interrupted every 45 minutes because of the uh, of the uh, orbit. Uh, which have a much more uh, stable conditions, and so I think one can be reasonably content to reach performance at least as good as HST, which is right now at a level of, of what 20 ppm. With a lot of picture, uh, I think uh, we can hope we'll do, we'll do better. This kind of example: um, uh, if you the the test yield, and statistically statistically speaking, the the closest transiting system. Uh, an Earth like system in the Hubble zone get about at, at 13 parsec. So, this is an actual simulation here where we just naively plug in an Earth like atmosphere around, around, around that, that, that end dwarf, that, 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 that planet. And not this is a, a credible uh, atmosphere model. It's just to show you uh, the kind of signal one might expect if you were to enter into this, this large program. And there, uh, the, the noise level. Uh, just by statistics, is at the 5 to 10 ppm. That's the model that was done by Lisa Kaltenegger uh, in our team. Uh, so I, 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 just by eye, and uh, people doing spectral retrieval will, will, would certainly tell you that there's water and CO2 and lycopene in this atmosphere. But one more egg is that this star, which is relatively bright, uh, it, it is OK to do with, uh, with, with NIRIS. Uh, but uh, we can only do it with a relatively poor observing efficiency, about 3%. And because nature these transits only every couple of weeks, you have to accumulate a lot of them. And here, this is the case where you've got 50 transits. And the clock for this is actually three years. So it gives you the, uh, the challenge that uh, uh, it will correspond to do uh, Earth like system uh, in the habitable zone around M dwarf. We're trying to improve, obviously, to uh, to improve the observing efficiency. We're, uh, today, we have a talk on uh, the transit working group, uh, a discussion about uh, the possibility of a new readout mode. Uh, that was actually an idea from Caltech, Ron Smith, to do a set mode, uh, 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 a mode that would be 100% efficient in terms of collecting photons. So, um, uh, well, we see goes, but our plan is to try to to, uh, to have that invented and tested in the, the next uh, uh, next year, year or so. Okay, talk about contamination. So uh, uh, a great capability don't always come with a price. Uh, we're creating a lot of uh, range. That means a lot of field of view. And so uh, you, if you have other stars in your field of view, they will contaminate uh, your, your spectrum. Here are two cases here, uh, 1214. At this specific angle, as you know, you, as, the, as the observatory goes around the Earth, uh, Earth around the Sun, uh, the field is rotating. So these uh, these uh, contamination will change with time. So the base is a, a, a target that is considered for GTF. Uh, this is a, a binary star with a brown dwarf around it that that transiting LHS 6343, uh, and it's started by 0.6 arc seconds, and it creates a, a double trace. Uh, so they just show you the kind of uh, uh, data that one. That, that, that one. Okay, the next 
slide is actually a tool that was recently developed by one of our uh, team members, David Lafonnière, who's our near exoplanet uh, team leader. Uh, so this is a tool for planning your observations uh, judiciously. Uh, a, a target in the sky cannot observe all the time, uh, we obviously, unless it is in the, the CV, the continuous viewing zone. Uh, so focus on one on, on uh, on my talk here, the, so the, the, the first order. So what you see here are the regions of visibility of, of, of the target. So any, anything that is attached can be observed. You cannot observe during during that, that at those roll angles, which played into a, a time during the year, which I'm not here right now. And the plot on the right uh, gives the actual the fraction of the spectrum channels that are contaminated above a certain threshold. Okay. For example, thing that is blue means that spectrum is contaminated uh, 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 at the level of 10% uh, um, and by uh, the amount that is shown there. So basically, uh, you want to program your observation when anything is white on this diagram. Uh, so for example, this is the case of GG1214. Uh, it, it may sound bad, but it, it actually five degrees corresponds to uh, basically five days. And so there's an uh, uh, amount of windows we can observe that specific target. That's that anything that is in the close to galactic plane uh, or faint uh, with a, a large uh, contamination. So target uh, is a case which, you know, a target we were considering for our GTO, and now it's basically Alice. You can see that this thing is close to the, the galactic plane. And the, the contamination is just overwhelming. You're not find uh, a good uh, time of the year to observe that target. Not would be it is completely impossible to correct for these contamination, uh, but obviously you want to, to avoid it. And so this is, uh, say, the perfect target for nearest. But there are plenty, plenty more that we can do. So this, if you're really desperate to do that target, you would probably consider near spec. Uh, in an, uh, with this, with uh, its uh, slit mode. In fact, it's a uh, slit mode. Okay. Um, moving to aperture masking interferometry. Um, so here we're taking this uh, component in the pupil wheel, which is a mask, which is basically our sub aperture, said sub, sub aperture aligned with the uh, the uh, one of the uh, segments. And it, it, uh, they are arranged such that uh, there's, there's no, uh, the, the, all the baselines are redundant. That's what we call the, that, that a redundant mask. And you combine that with uh, three filters, which are chosen so that we have a, a, a good constraint on uh, the and temp effective temperature for looking at uh, our planets, uh, gas planets. Basic principle is which I won't have to I won't have time to go in details, but uh, the the actual image that you get is the as seen on the uh, in the middle of the of our diagram here. This is a uh, a very strange PSF, and the transfer of that gives you an actual an image that looks very much like the one we have at the bottom, and you uh, uh, you know a clean measurement of the amplitude and and, and the phase, and uh, anything that is uh, that is point like. -like Will change these these uh, the, these patterns, and so basically you you, you make a, a closure phase uh, a diagram of all possible baseline you can have, and you get that with a model, and you can uh, detect uh, something that is uh, very close to your object, as close as half of the over D. Mode probe very small separations between 40 and 400 milliseconds, which is very complementary to other to the Nyakam chronograph. Uh, because of up to maybe 10 inches, but, but we're conservative. We're, we're thinking we can do easily 9 inches. And see here the, the, the limits, the ground base limit at L and M', M prime. So we can prove that by um, certainly a, a good magnitude. And it's very, very, very small. Here, uh, 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 I meet with uh, the uh, Neocam uh, chronograph. Uh, just to show you that uh, uh, you know the, the the size of the circle is the uh, the inner working angle of the the the, uh, the, the outer. So 
basically uh, we're looking within the culture of NIRCAM, which is uh, hard. This is a, a, a gray mask, but still. And so on, on the left, what you see is what, what we call a detection map. It's not a, an image per se. This is basically a model whereby you've got a companion. You don't know where it is. Uh, you're using a closer phase analysis. You can drive this kind of a, a detection map to tell you uh, uh, this is a probability map where a, a, a component should be and which amplitude it should have. The specific case here is the simulations of a, a, a one to two Jupiter mass object at one year on an M0 star uh, at Parsec. I forgot to mention that this is, for, this is for a young star, obviously, a figure year uh, young star, and it was about three hours to, uh, to get to kind of sensitivity. Science one can do with this. Uh, so this plot show you, uh, uh, I did this plot some while ago to, uh, which is the potential yield of the Gemini Planet Imager. Uh, I'm a member of this, of this consortium. Uh, obviously, we haven't found that many planets. But to show you that, uh, uh, you know, anything in red are planets that can be detected with, with NIRCAM. But as we get below the inner width angle of the NIRCAM chronograph around 0.5 arc seconds, that is where uh, uh, AMI can be, can be useful. And below 0.2 seconds, that's uh, most ground-based instruments are pretty much lying there because of the, the chronograph that are, that are used. So uh, anything that is relatively bright, uh, uh, if there are any kind of a fine Jupiter mass object like in the HR799 system, but very close to the uh, nearest uh, should be able to, to detect them. The next slide will use actual uh, only detections, or well, well, new detections from GPI 513, uh, which we're very proud of, and gives you where, where it sits. So it would be at the limit of being detected with uh, uh, with uh, NR. Okay, so something that can be also very useful for is astrometry. Uh, uh, and a very case for it is uh, Beta Pig B, uh, which, uh, has already has, which has all, uh, there's a lot of astrometric measurement on, on it. And so uh, we're basically mapping out the, orb, the, the orbit of, the, of this object. And this object is just uh, moving behind the star and will come out around 2020, just on time. Uh, uh, for for we have to catch it, and that's a perfect target for for nearest E. It's a bright source uh, and band, and the operation will be around 0 0.15, 0 0.8, 0 0.18 arc second. So uh, likely that one of the very first astrometry measurement measurement taken from Beta B uh, in 2020 will likely be from Webb with uh, uh, AMI on on Mary. Okay, on the last part of my my talk, which is the uh, nearest GTO program of you. So this is our, our, our nearest science team, uh, the core science team, which the people that have been there all along, back in 2001 or so. The instrument team, people that are scattered around uh, uh, here at my team and uh, at uh, mostly in Baltimore and, and so uh, uh, HIA in Canada, and barrel graders, uh, they're all working on, 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 on our GTOs. Uh, this is not fixed. This team is actually expanding, and we'll soon have a new member uh, from the uh, exoplanet spectroscopy team, Benecke, who has expertise in uh, spectral retrieval and uh, transit spectroscopy. So we're for you to have Bjorn getting on board. Okay, the uh, our GTO program uh, has uh, 450 hours. Uh, uh, I have to say this is well clock time. Uh, this is uh, typically the overhead correspond to about 30%, so we have to take that into account. We have two core programs. The details are still to be finalized. Uh, we have until June of next year to finalize our targets, but we're moving on, moving along quite well. So one of our programs is High Richard Galaxies, uh, with us, uh, about 200 hours. We have a strong program on exoplanet characterization, which is another 200 hours there. Pretty much goes to transit eclipse and phase curve with the sauce, a little bit of high contrast imaging with AMI. And we're and also we'll have also some uh, miscellaneous programs at the level of 50 hours uh, to do various things, AGM imaging with AMI, which I did not have time to talk about. 
and next program using uh, WIFAS to do a uh, substellar MF in young clusters. Uh, you can get down to projects very easily and quickly uh, using splitless and without having to do any pre imaging. It's a very efficient way of, of doing that. And one decision we have to make, which is not done yet, is what fraction of our GTO, GTO time will be in cycle one. Most of it will be in cycle one, uh, but uh, we may learn some time for cycle two targets. But really, what uh, a highlight of what these programs uh, are, are, are will be. Uh, again, this is still preliminary, but that's that's mature enough to tell you where we're we're heading to. So the high shift program is the uh, uh, wide field spectroscopy. Uh, 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 there's basically two 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 sides of the high high part. They want to understand the property of early low luminosity galaxies, uh, the slope uh, as probe of stellar population. Uh, the Lamin Alpha transmission uh, to probably IgM. Uh, we're getting a, a little bit of near cam imaging to constrain the old cell population. So th this program needs a little bit of uh, of near time. The limit is to busy understand the evolution of low mass, low luminous galaxy across cosmic time, uh, and so we can do that very high spatial resolution uh, to you know get information on mass, fidelity, dust, and cell population. Um, so we're uh, targeting clusters uh, so that we have uh, lensing to take advantage of that, uh, and uh, you know this is our, our, our strategy. We we did a, some uh, fair work to trade off blank fields versus uh, our clusters, but we're converging to use uh, clusters. So all that is led by my colleague in, in Victoria, uh, Chris Willett, uh with a whole bunch of people. Uh, right now, our, our program. Focus on six strong lensing uh, uh, cluster fields covering the 2.3 micron at uh, resolving power about 150. So, back to So, the, the guiding principle is basically to focus on, on risk and guiding scientific stuff. Uh, of course, we'll take some risks, but uh, the, the goal is to demonstrate risk capabilities. Uh, we have a good understanding of the of the, of the performance of the performance of our instrument from measurements in the on the CB3 test campaign, but obviously this is on orbit that we'll we'll know. Uh, and so in general, we're focusing on relatively short observation, single single visit. But we're programmed to uh, so that it has some good legacy. Um, so the function we want to address are the same that all instrument teams are looking at. Uh, really think. Web uh, uh, will give us uh, much better handling on the the actual uh, uh, metallicity of these planets. Uh, to questions like uh, is atmospheric metal enrichment a hallmark of planets? Are the chamber of planet mass type and migration history? Uh, planets share abundance ratio as to their parent star. Of course, this has bearing on the metal formation. Uh, clouds. Uh, we know that there are at least lots of super that are very cloudy. So are they uh, So we're 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 talking to, we're trying to get a, a, a range of of, of planet hot jupiters to to Earth supers uh, cover a wide range of primary space. Um, most target will be for primary transit, but we'll have also a few secondary eclipses, and we'll have also one uh, one phase curve, complete phase curve uh, uh, to. Okay, exoplanet imaging with AMI. Uh, so one thing we want to do here is, uh, as I mentioned, to do follow-up of GPI and sphere targets. Uh, so far, there aren't that many, uh, and uh, the the I don't have time to discuss it, but the the three filters that we have provide pretty good handling on in te effective temperatures. Not, so we've been very careful not to have a device that can, gives you detection. We want to do some science with it, uh, and should we detect a target? You'll be able to follow it up with uh, at the other two two wheel lines get you uh, some constraint on the fundamental parameters of the uh, of the planet. So I mentioned uh, the kind of uh, photometry and astrometry one can do on Beta Pig B. Uh, one thing that we're uh, we're uh, working on is to look for uh, suspected protoplanets in transitional disks like the Cassium 15 uh, system. Uh, so you can see it's, it's pretty challenging in terms of uh, inner waking angle, and pretty much only uh, nearest uh, can can do this kind of of start with ME. 
Okay. Uh, I, I hope I've demonstrated you that NERIS has very complementary and redundant capabilities for NERCAM and NERSPAC and, and MIRI. Uh, I'm, I'm very, I, I very much like the, the soft mode with, with, for its broad wavelength coverage, uh, dynamic range, uh, uh, which will be a very unique uh, workforce capability to do uh, transit spectroscopy and faker on generative on speed. And um, you know, a quick summary of, uh, of NERIS and uh, uh, just go to, to grab the uh, NERIS pocket guide. And then we'll have uh, many tools uh, that are the instrument team are developing that will, made, uh, that will be made available to the community for people to, to, to plan their observations. Um, there are questions, I guess, first here in the room in Pasadena. How about folks online? Uh, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourselves to ask. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? 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 Can one, I'm really a neophyte at all this uh, JWST stuff. Um, can, is your um, instrument suited for, and do you have plans to perhaps um, in, the, in a wide field search look for um, free floating um, planets uh, that are not associated directly with any stars? And if you are, I mean, plans do I target the nuclei? New regions of some of these young nearby uh, groups. Uh, actually, we have a, a program very similar to this. Actually, Ben, uh, this is called. We have a working group on um, on stellar IMF, which is led by Ray Javana from York and other people, Alex Schultz, and we're doing exactly what you what you described. We're using the slit load uh, to look for a free free for flow planets. And young clusters, uh, so we're still being uh, which which one we're going to do, uh, but and you know, it doesn't take all that long. It's uh, talking about the uh, ten-hour program, so maybe two clusters. Um, and ideally, we'd like to do more, but of course we have to choose. Uh, so the 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 goal here is to demonstrate ability, and but but yeah, to do very good science with the data what that that it will have. Okay, um, thank you again, Ray, uh, for telling us about NERIS today. Uh, next month, I think we have a talk by Susan Casson, who's going to tell us about data analysis tools. Um, so a great month, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.